Titus chapter 1. So here's a question for you. Can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? Uh, you say, okay. Now, you've heard that. Many of you heard that. Uh, but think about it. And so if you work through it mentally, it's kind of funny. Can God make a rock so big? And you're like, well, yeah, sure. God can do anything. God can do anything. And that's what you grew up believing. So you say, so God can do anything. But can, you, can, you, can he make a rock so big that he cannot lift it? Oh, then that means he can't do something. He can't lift a rock that he made that's so big. But wait, then he couldn't make a rock. Well, oh, bzz, bzz, you start to short circuit a little bit. You're like, oh no, I don't believe in God anymore. <laughs> now, now you, you laugh, but sadly, there, have, there actually have been people whose faith has been shaken because of that question. Uh, now, what's interesting is Paul instructed us when we were reading First and Second Timothy, several times he kind of gave the charge, don't give heed to foolish questions. Man, don't even waste your time with that stuff. And I believe uh, that that's something we should be careful of. There are people who are asking those questions that are just trying to, you know, uh, create havoc and division and using a false dilemma to uh, sort of uh, create this uh, lack of faith in people. Now, fortunately, most people have kind of figured out that that's, that's an impossible question. Uh, but, but everything's possible with God, people say. And so there's still people that wrestle. And by the way, that question wasn't originally asked uh, derogatorily or to be, um, to be problematic. It was actually out that we read history books all the way back to the medieval period when uh, there were certain guys who raised the question. They called it the omnipotence paradox. The omnipotence paradox. And that is, could an omnipotent being, which God is omnipotent, in fact, the word omnipotent, Omnipotent, all-powerful, all-powerful. But what does that word omnipotent mean? It links to the word almighty in the Bible. But almighty is saying there's no one mightier. There's no one more potent or powerful than God. And that is absolutely true. But here's the question. Does omnipotent mean God can do anything? And so the argument in the medieval times raged, even uh, dating uh, at least to the 12th century, uh, addressed by uh, Averroes, a a philosopher uh, that raised that omnipotence uh, paradox. Uh, Later on, uh, a guy named Thomas Aquinas came along, and um, he made this assertion. He said that the paradox of, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it, arises from a misunderstanding of the word omnipotence. Of course, the book of Revelation is the only place where that word omnipotent is used in the Bible. Um, There in the heavenly scene, the Lord God Almighty, or omnipotent, reigneth. Uh, You know, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know that whole thing. Uh, The Lord God omnipotent, all-powerful. But does that mean that God could do everything or anything? Uh, So Thomas Aquinas says that that's the problem, the word omnipotence. He maintains that inerrant contradictions... And logical impossibilities do not fall under the omnipotence of God. Uh, that's what he came up with. He said, well, I don't know. That's, that's kind of a cop-out, maybe. Maybe. Later, C.S. Lewis. Maybe you guys know C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia. But he was quite a thinker and an apologist. Uh, he argues that uh, when talking about omnipotence, God's all-powerfulness, uh, referencing a rock so heavy that God cannot lift it, <coughs> uh, he says, it is nonsense just, making, just as making a reference to a square circle. Uh, that's a square circle. Uh, that, you can't say that. That's, that's uh, illogical and doesn't work. He says that it, uh, that it is not logically coherent in terms of power to think that omnipotence includes the power to do the logically impossible. So asking, can God uh, create a rock so heavy that he, even he cannot lift it? It's just as much as nonsense as saying, can God draw a square circle? And uh, the answer to that is, uh, it's logically impossible. Now, that gets me closer, closer. Uh, but but uh, I think it's interesting. There was actually an, a confirmed atheist who gave an answer that is probably the best, which, which I think is interesting that an atheist has to come to the defense of us Christians asking foolish questions. Uh, And here's what Isaac Asimov uh, said. Uh, He answered a a variation of this question. Uh, And he takes it more scientific. And for you science nuts, you'll love this. For the rest of us, we're kind of like, well, um, uh, check it out. He says, what happens when an irresistible force 
An irresistible force meets an immovable object. Now, in the laws of physics, science, those are um, quantified uh, definitions. Uh, irresistible force and an immovable object. He says, what happens uh, when these two meet? He points out that Albert Einstein de uh, demonstrated the equivalence of mass energy. That is, according to the relativity theory, uh, mass is simply frozen energy. Energy is simply liquid mass. Uh, so that's real fancy. You say, great, Brett, I don't understand that. But he's basically saying this. In order to be either an immovable force uh, or an irresistible force, the entity must possess, possess the majority of en energy in the system. Okay, do you understand that? For either one of those to exist, that, that one of those things has to possess the majority of energy in that system or that universe, as the scientists would call it. Um, now, here's the problem. No system can have two majorities. A universe in which there exists such a thing as irresistible force is by definition a universe which cannot also contain an immovable object. A universe which contains an immovable object, by definition, also cannot uh, contain an irresistible force. So the question is essentially, and this is what he wrote, the question is meaningless. Either the force is irresistible or the object is immovable, but not both. Asimov points out that the question is the logical fallacy of the pseudo-question. Uh, it's a fake question. Uh, that's what he says. Uh, just because we can string words together to form what looks like a coherent sentence does not mean the sentence really makes any sense. <laughs> that was the atheist coming to our rescue, saying, you Christians, don't worry about it. It's a pseudo-question, and we shouldn't stress about it. Now, uh, all that to say, uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17 is one of the many scriptures that tell us that God is all-powerful, almighty. In fact, I love Jeremiah 32, 17. There he says, ah, oh, Lord God, exclamation point. He says, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And that's the truth. There is nothing too hard for God. I agree with the Bible on that. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 27, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? The Lord himself rhetorically asks. Is there anything hard for me? And, and the answer is no. Now, again, uh, those things that are logical and right, there's nothing. Is there anything hard for the Lord? No. Now, uh, you got to be careful in this one because the Lord is able to even surpass logic and do things that are great that are even illogical, like using a person like me or even more crazy, using a person like you. <laughs> uh, it's illogical, right? But God can still use goofballs. And, and the Bible says the Lord chooses to use the weak and the foolish. So there, there is a certain amount of illogical behavior that God can say, I can fix that. And it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to do that. But the point is, uh, here's something that's going to maybe surprise some of you. Did you know that it's absolutely true that God cannot do everything or any, anything that he wants to do? Oh, heresy! God can make a rock so big that he can, can lift it. Uh, no, that's, that's stupid. You can't say that. There are things that the Bible tells us that God cannot do. Did you know that? Now you say, oh man, that's, that's going to shake my faith. I don't know if I can believe in God. God never claims to be able to do everything. There's nothing that's too hard for him, but he, he claims in his word, in fact, that there are things that he cannot do. Well, Brad, that's maybe because he will not do it. Well, we'll explore that a little bit. I want to show you some of my favorite things that God cannot do. Um, you say, how can they be favorite? That's only limiting God. No, the fact is, the things that God can't do, I am so thankful for. What do you mean? Well, let's show you the first one. It's right here in the first couple verses of our text in Titus. Uh, that's why I'm talking about this stuff. It's because it's where we are in the Bible, and this little phrase is somewhat surprising. Check it out. It says, Paul, verse 1 of chapter 1 of Titus, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Did you see it? God cannot lie. That's something God can't do. You mean there's something God can't do? Praise the Lord for that one. God cannot lie. It's not within him. It's not within his power to lie to humanity. 
Uh, now, it's interesting, as I was studying this, you know, I always like to say, Lord, what would you have us to learn today? What would you teach us from your word? And there's so many things in this verse that, to me, uh, are so huge that we could talk about. We could talk about the hope of eternal life. That'd be a good sermon for a Sunday morning. Uh, we could talk about godliness, which Paul keeps bringing up with these pastoral epistles. Uh, we could talk about his promises before the world begins. We could talk all about all kinds of things. But I kept coming back to this truth uh, that God cannot lie. And so the Lord just put it on my heart to say, let's talk about the things God can't do. And the greatness of this thing that God can't do is that he is so trustworthy. God cannot lie. Now, it's humanity that makes God seem to be a liar, but he is not. Uh, There are so many issues that man uh, makes God a liar. Uh, Let me give you a big one. Here's, Here's a big one. Uh, Of course, Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, let God be true and every man a liar. So anybody who controverts God, it creates a liar on the earth. If you say God is wrong in this, then you are a liar according to the Bible. But God is right. Here's a big one, and I'm going to use this one because it's something that the church, a lot of church people believe, but it makes them liars. What do you mean? Well, let me just say this. God made an everlasting covenant with the Jews in the Old Testament. True or false? False. It's spoken over and over and over again. In fact, there's few themes in the Bible that are more uh, repetition uh, uh, than that notion of God's people, the Jews, how he would never leave them or forsake them. And he he made a covenant with them. In fact, he even cut covenant with Abraham. And the idea is you'd pass through these cut pieces of uh, beef uh, and you'd walk through them and uh, make a covenant between two people. The thing is, God made a covenant with Abraham, only God was the only one who passed through the covenant, and Abraham was asleep the whole time. What does that mean? It means that God's promise to the Jews was based only on him and not on the Jews themselves. So when he says, I will make of you, Abraham, a mighty nation, and an everlasting covenant, where eventually he said that, that one of your descendants will rule uh, and reign forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God omnipotent reigneth. That's a promise that was made to the Jewish nation, to the Jewish people. So the church comes along. And, and, uh, you know, the Jews, they said the Jews killed Jesus Christ. Uh, Technically, the Jews did kill Jesus. And the Romans were involved as well. And so were you. And and so so, uh, was I. That is, that anybody who sinned, which is everyone... Uh, sent Christ to the cross. But, but somewhere along the way, the church said, well, since the Jews were the ones who said crucify him, they are no longer God's chosen people. And so there's this weird and wrong teaching uh, that, that, in fact, much of the, most of the Catholics believe, and many Protestants as well, uh, believe in a replacement theology. That is, that God replaced the Jews with the Christian church, the Gentiles. To me, it's one of the most dangerous teachings that, that you hear today. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, the, the biggest deal is it makes God a liar. That God promised that I will have an everlasting covenant with you and I will make of you a mighty nation and out of you will come a king that reigns forever. You say, Brett, that's great, but we're the new chosen people. So he's keeping his promise, but not to the Jews if you believe that. See, the, the, all you gotta do is read Romans 9, 10, and 11. Those three chapters say that God is not done with the Jewish people. Yes, they are blinded mostly in, uh, right now, the Bible says. They don't see that Jesus really is the Messiah, but they will. And uh, all of Israel will eventually be saved. Romans chapter 11, right around verse 25 and 26 tells us about that. But that's an example of church saying, well, God has left Israel forsaken them, which makes him a liar. That's why I'm so offended by replacement theology. God has made a covenant with his people. Now, here's another thing that should scare you if you're a replacement theologist, <laughs> theologian. Here's the problem. Uh, if God forsook the Jews for good reason, then what keeps them from forsaking you? I mean, are you any better than the Jews? I mean, think about this. The Jews, sure, they worshiped idols and did a lot of sinful things, but congratulations, so have you. We, we, uh, we're not even ashamed of it. We have a show called American Idol. It's like we, we like to put it out there, American idolatry or whatever. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, we have our own version of idols, not just that, but it might be, you know, instead of going to church, we like to polish up our idols of chrome, rubber, and steel out in the driveway. 
We've got our own idols, all our little things that we worship and do. I mean, we're just as guilty as the Jews. And if God forsook them, what keeps them from forsaking you? And the point is, that's why that's such a dangerous thing to say, well, God didn't mean what he said. So the point is, the fact that God cannot lie, when he makes a promise, when he makes a covenant with his people, man, what a joyful and beautiful thing that is. So when I read the Bible and it says that you can be saved by confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe that, confess it, it says you will be saved. Man, I, I cling to that and I, I know that God is not a liar and so I'm gonna trust him. Oh, I think about, man, how can he save a guy like me? How can he forgive the sins that I've committed? And I can still wrestle with that, but it always gets back down to God keeps his word. He's not a liar. God cannot lie. Don't you love that one? He keeps his promises. That's good. Uh, now, by the way, Jesus, who is God in the flesh, God became a man, lived among us. The fact is, what's so cool about that is Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, Jesus was the embodiment of God in the flesh, living in man. He was 100% man, and yet 100% God, which is a mystery. But he, 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 in his being, he says, I am the way, the truth. Even Jesus is the truth. That's why he cannot lie, because he's just the definition of truth. Uh, number two on our list of things God cannot do. Let's move to another one. Number one, God cannot lie. Um, uh, oh, let me give you one more scripture on, on God cannot lie. Hebrews 6.18. Uh, this is another one, in case you want a little more evidence. Uh, it says... Uh, by two immutable things in which God, it, with, with God, is it, imp, it, it is impossible for God to lie that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Uh, that's Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. The point is, because he does not lie, cannot lie, we have the hope of eternal uh, life. That's the Lord. Number two, God cannot be tempted with evil. Did you know that? God cannot be tempted with evil. Uh, turn with me to James chapter one. I'll show you a little scripture where that very plainly is spoken. <clears throat> James chapter one. This is important because uh, again, people lie and say God is tempted with evil. What do you mean? Um, you know how the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Or the Lord says, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Oh man, Lord, settle down, man. Don't be so temper tantrum, you know? Don't, don't be such a, well, wait a minute. You gotta remember, when God is, says I'm a jealous God, he's not jealous of you. That's our jealousy. We're jealous of each other. God is jealous for you against the enemy, Satan. Do you understand that? It's a righteous jealousy. That's, that's God. And, um, and his anger is a righteous anger. There's no unrighteousness. And he's not even tempted by sinful behavior or attitudes. That's a law, by the way. Isn't the law and Jehovah the same, according to Wolf Blitzer on CNN? Eh, not. The Muslims don't believe Jehovah is the same as the law, and the Christians don't believe uh, Jehovah is the same as the law. It's only the uh, college professors in America uh, that say that Jehovah and Allah are the same. See, Allah is a capricious God that cannot be known, and you never know what mood he's really in. That's what the Muslims believe. And so you better be on your best behavior and, because, man, you never know if he's going to squish you like a bug on a windshield or if he's going to bring you with all your virgins into heaven. Allah cannot be known. The beautiful thing about being a Christian who worships the true and living God is God can be known and his personality is very clear and we, we, we learn that God uh, it doesn't have sinful personality. He doesn't on one day have a bad day, get up on the rotten side of the God bed up in heaven. It doesn't happen. Uh, God is not tempted. We see that in James chapter one, verse 13. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God cannot be tempted uh, with evil. That's interesting to me. Uh, it's one of the things God cannot do. Uh, now, uh, the thing that's interesting about this, God cannot be tempted with evil. Deity, according to the Bible, is not tempted by sin. Uh, in fact, the Bible teaches us, if you kind of look through the cover of the book, through the book, you realize that, uh, that the holiness is actually repulsed by sin. Now, the more you and I become like God, uh, we'll never be God, but we'd like to be like him. Um, what you'll find is you'll start to be more and more repulsed by things you used to love. 
Have you guys found that to be true? Things you used to do, uh, you realize, man, I don't do those things anymore because they're repulsive. Uh, I thought they were great at the time, but I realized they were destructive and hurtful and it messed up my life. Uh, God knows all those things from the very get-go because he knows all things. And so he says, man, uh, I'm not even tempted by that. Would God be tempted to uh, uh, smoke a joint for you weed head people? Would God be into that? Uh, oh, man, I think it's, the Lord knows. He knows what the fruit of that is. He knows the result of that. Hey, Brett, it's proven that pot doesn't affect the mental capacity of anyone. Uh, yeah, enough said. But all that said, uh, you know, God cannot be tempted with evil. For, uh, T- Titus 1.15, right here in our text, it says, to the pure... All things are pure, to those, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and their conscience are defiled. Uh, so, so the Lord, he, he only knows truth and purity. I love that. God cannot be tempted with evil. By the way, on this one as well, uh, just a, a note, God cannot tempt man. That's another thing he cannot do. Uh, you can put that as number three. God cannot tempt man. We saw that in James 1.13. God does not put a temptation in front of you. Wait a minute, Brett. I don't know about that. Well, it says it right here. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither be tempted uh, he tempted any man. Years ago, I was sitting with a young guy at Bob's Big Boy Burger. I know, a big shock, me, sitting, eating a burger. But there we were, enjoying a, uh, a beautiful hamburger. And uh, this young kid, he was going through all kinds of trials, tons of trials, tons of, of temptations and stuff like that. And he and I were just talking, and I was sharing some scriptures with him. And I, I said, you know, sometimes the Lord allows us to go through trials. And he allows us to go through temptations. And right when I, and I was sharing this with this guy, because he was asking, well, why would God do this? And I was, I was getting ready to share. Well, apparently this uh, elderly gal and her husband, they were sitting next to us in the booth next to us, and, and they were listening to our whole conversation. And apparently she didn't like what I was saying because she burst up and she ran to our table, bright red face and angry, and she said, God does not test anyone, tempt anybody. Um, and I know what she was thinking. She was, she was thinking James chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, good for her. Problem is, she doesn't understand. When you go to the story of Job, for example, Did God allow Job to be tested, tempted? Absolutely. God allowed it. Was God the source of the temptation? No, he was not. Uh, The source was very clearly who? Satan, right? Satan approached God and said, look at Job, man. You've blessed him so much. Look at him. No wonder he follows you. If you let me mess with him, temptation, then he will deny you and curse you to your face. And so the Lord allowed that to happen but here's the thing that you gotta, you gotta understand. The Lord didn't send the temptation. That's something we need to know. Uh, what God will do, however, through those temptations that comes from the enemy or other sources, um, God will allow those to be items of testing. God will test you, but he will not tempt you. There's a difference. The, the, the thing that God allowed with Job was a test. Satan was the one who provided the temptation. Uh, you need to see that differentiation. And, and it's happened to all, even in the Garden of Eden. God uh, placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden. Uh, And that was the test. But Satan was the one who came along and tempted. Uh, Satan tempted them. uh, A test is to get you to do good and to learn. Uh, But a temptation is a a seduction to get you to do evil and to cause you to fail. I hope you recognize the difference. Because Satan never gives up on that one. He's always tempting. He works day and night to tempt you and to mess you up but the Lord will allow you to be tempted. Now, uh, this is important to understand, but uh, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, which comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So all good things come from God. Even a test is a good thing. And you say, well, that's great, uh, but uh, how good are these tests that I'm going through? I don't like them. But here's the thing, Romans 2, 4 says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, 
long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. That is, when the Lord allows you good te- te- uh, testing, uh, you might hate it. Testing is not always fun. I hated tests in high school and in college. I hated them. The last final exam of my senior year in college was perhaps one of the most joyful days of my entire life. I remember walking down the steps of the science hall with my last uh, physics class, just going, oh, praise the Lord, I'm free. I hate tests. But God gives you tests, and you might not like them, but they're all really for good. In fact, uh, we know that all things work together for good. So God, God sometimes allows temptation, Job, example, but he knows when to step in and rescue you too. Do you know that? Some of you are like, man, I don't like this. I hate the story of Job because my life resembles it too much. I remember uh, when we were going through the, the book of Job uh, as a church, you know, it's a fairly lengthy book. And Job's friends wax very long and painful. And we're just going through it, drudging through Job. And I remember some people saying, Brett, can you please hurry? Why? Because uh, my life is starting to match Job's. Can we just get through that book? Because, you know, we always say where we're at in the Bible is where we're at in life. So when we went through Job, a lot of people said, yep, that was true. Uh, so look forward to Job. Uh, uh, of course, we've got Revelation coming first, and the rapture of the church will happen before that. So hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> but all that said, uh, here's the deal. Uh, one of the great verses that you, many of you know about temptation uh, and the trials and the testing is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You know it. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. In other words, you're not unique. Uh, every temptation you face, everybody else faces too, maybe in different forms and fashions, but we're all tempted commonly. But God is faithful, it goes on, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. Now listen, this is the key. But with the temptation, he will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I love that. Have you ever been tempted so much like, I can't bear it anymore? You're a liar. Let God be true and every man will. You can bear it and you can do it. The Lord, he'll never tempt you above. You might be hanging by your fingernails and think I'm going down. Uh, but the Lord will provide the way of escape. Now here, by the way, real key, when you're going through trials and temptations, one of the things you should do is look for the escape hatch. That's what you've got to do. You've got to look for, because the, the Lord says the Lord will provide a way of escape. And uh, it's funny to me, because I've noticed in, in, in the people that I talk with in my own life, I'll be messing up and my life is doing something where I know I'm being tempted and I'm putting myself in a place of temptation and the Lord provides escape hatches along the way. It's not just one, it's many. Have you seen this? Uh, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you can just keep denying, I'm not gonna take that. I'm gonna keep playing around with sin. I'm gonna keep putting myself in a place, uh, making provision for the flesh. And as the doors go by of escape hatches, red letters, escape, handle, you can bail out. We don't. But the key is to escape, run for your life. That's the idea. And the Lord will always provide that. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So God cannot lie. God cannot be tempted <clears throat> with, to do evil. And God cannot tempt man. These are things the Bible says God cannot do. Let's go a little more in the abstract. Here's something for you. God cannot learn anything new. Have you thought about this? God cannot learn anything new. Uh, why? Right, he knows everything already. <laughs> uh, he's, he, it's, it's another one of the omni words in the Bible. There are three main ones. Omniscient means that he's all-knowing. Omni, omnipotent means he's all-powerful. Power, uh, uh, omnipresent means that he's able to be everywhere. He uh, uh, encompasses all things. He's everywhere. He, and the reason for that is he's infinite. God is infinite, according to the Bible. But this idea of omniscient, it, it, it really kind of changes the equation when you really think it through. Because God knows everything. In fact, there's a bunch of scriptures that we can, uh, we can talk about in that. But uh, uh, one is uh, uh, Job chapter 37, where he says, His knowledge, in fact, is perfect. 
complete is the idea. Psalm 147 verse 5 says that the Lord's uh, knowledge is beyond measure, immeasurable. He knows all things. Um, And uh, Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10 says this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. In other words, he knows the end from the beginning, from the ancient times all the way to the things that are not even yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do my good pleasure. One of the things about God that's unique is that he knows all things and he knows the past, the present, and the future. That's one of the things that makes this book miraculous, by the way, the Bible. It's the only book that with with 100% success is nailing the beginning from the end. Uh, There's so many prophecies we can talk about that the Bible's talked about. Even Cyrus, the Mede, who came and attacked Babylon, the Bible said that was going to happen 100 years earlier, and it named him by name. The Lord says, a a dude named Cyrus, 100 years from now, is going to come and take over Babylon. He named him by name. I love that. And you say, well, Brett, I don't know about that. No, Isaiah wrote it. The, the dating of Isaiah, we know. And Jesus said that Isaiah knew what he was talking about. So if you say, I don't know if it's not a real Isaiah, then you've got an argument with Jesus. Uh, it's an interesting thing that the Bible does. It predicts things like the Jews. The Jews, we talked about this last week, the Jews would be scattered. The Bible says that was going to happen all over the world. It's called the diaspora. But then 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years later, the Jews are regathered into the same land where they were when, uh, in, their, in their father's days, which is Israel. And that happened. In our lifetime, that prophecy, uh, many of our lifetimes, many of you, the older folks in here, uh, if you were alive on May 14th, 1948, you saw Bible prophecy come to pass perfectly. Why? Because God knows the whole story. He knows the beginning from the end. It's like if you could imagine you're uh, watching the Rose Parade here in Portland. And you're sitting there on the street corner with your duct tape marking your little area. And you're watching the parade go by. You don't know what's coming around the corner. You only see what's in front of you. That's linear. That's the way we see things. But God is sort of like in the K2 helicopter up there. And he sees the beginning of the parade and the end of the parade. He sees the whole thing because he's omniscient. He knows all things. I love this about God. So with that in mind, God cannot learn. He cannot be surprised because he's omniscient. Now, this is good news. See, I'm so encouraged. I'm encouraged, number one, God cannot lie. I'm encouraged that God cannot be tempted, that God's not going to have a bad day and thump me because he's in a bad mood. I'm glad that God cannot tempt me, and he knows the level of temptation that I can handle. But I'm also glad that God is omniscient, and here's why. Because knowing all things, did you know that God cannot be disappointed in you? That's amazing to me. See, I can be disappointed. I can say, look at you. Oh, I had such high hopes for you. But look at yourself. I can't believe what you have done. And you'd say, yeah, 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 that's right. But, but God, he doesn't say that. Why? Because he knew. He knew exactly what you would do. He knew how bad, the depths that you would sink. And yet what's amazing is you're still here at church on a Sunday morning. Uh, God's still working on you. He's still chipping away. If you're not here, then I get a little worried because, you know, you're off doing your own thing and the Lord can't speak to you and use you in the context of the church, even though the Bible says you're supposed to do that. But, but the fact is you're here and God's speaking to you and he's still, he, but, but Brad, he, does he know all things? The Bible says, Hebrews tells us that everything is naked and open before him, the Lord, with whom we have to do even your very thoughts. He sees it all. And not only the thoughts that you thunk right now, but he sees the thoughts that you're going to think 20 years from now should you still be alive. Isn't that amazing? And yet he still says, I choose you and I love you. The foreknowledge of God. It's a radical, radical truth. And so we can be assured that God cannot learn, thus he cannot be disappointed. The implications of God's omniscience is pretty powerful. Uh, Here's another one. Did you know that God cannot change? God cannot change. The Bible tells us that. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. That's another one. He's talking to the Jews in that context. He's saying, O sons of Jacob, that's the Jewish people. He says, I cannot change, so be comforted by that. 
God does not change. Again, I told you, he doesn't have a bad day. One day changing to be a mean guy and the next day changing to be a nice guy. Again, that's a law of the Muslims. Speaking of the Quran and changing, you know, um, one of the things that I love about the Bible is it does not change. We Christians have not gone through our Bible over and over again and changed things that we didn't like. Well, I should say the people that are, uh, are, are not willing to uh, lose it altogether. There are people changing things. I think there's translations that are starting to change. Like, for example, if you had a New International or a King James or New American Standard or, you know, the old true translations, but when people start changing the Bible, you're in big trouble. So the Book of Mormon, what did they do? They changed the Bible. And not only that, they, they changed God. God is an ever-changing being if you're a Mormon. Even though the Bible says, I, the Lord, never change, what do they believe? Uh, let me quote to you uh, um, Joseph Smith in his uh, writings called The Times and Seasons, volume 5, page uh, 613, 614. He says that God used to be a man just like us, only living on another planet. Greetings, earthlings. That's what Joseph Smith said. In fact, uh, Brigham Young, his, proto, his follower or whatever later, um, Brigham Young in his Journal of Discourses, volume seven, page 333, also said, God used to be a man who lived on another planet. Well, then how did he become God? He was a really good Mormon is what they believe. If you're a really good Mormon, then what happens is you move from the terrestrial level of heaven to the telestial level of heaven. And then if you're really, really amazing, then you move to the celestial level of heaven. And that's how God went from being a man to being God. And you too, if you're a Mormon, who's really good, can move through those levels of heaven. And if you eventually reach that celestial level, you'll be given your own planet and you'll have your wonder babies and all this stuff. It's, it's an amazing story, but it's false. It's totally false. And you can become a God too. See, the problem with Mormonism is they have made God changing. Uh, it's a different God than the one I believe in. For the God I believe in is one who says, I am the Lord, I do not change. Uh, and remember James 1.17, we already read about how every good and perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Listen, with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. We worship a God that never, never changes. Um, and, and now here's where it gets really even, I think, even more cool. Um, did you know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? The Mormons had to change their Bible. They said in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. That's changing. But here's the thing. The Bible that we have doesn't change because it's, it's in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. This is an unchanging Word. I love that, that the fact that God is never changing and He cannot change, that makes it so the Word of God never changes and cannot change. If you're reading a Bible that they've changed, New World Translation or the Book of Mormon, run for your lives because they're changing it. By the way, the Book of Mormon... Uh, uh, I was able to look through a book, uh, it's called 3,913 Changes in the Book of Mormon by Gerald and Sandra Tanner. And what they did is they made a, basically a parallel Book of Mormon. <clears throat> and they went with the original one, the, you know, back in the days of Joseph Smith. Remember, that, was, that wasn't that long ago, really, relatively. And they showed how many changes, and they, right next to each other, the original one, and there's 3,913 3, changes in the Book of Mormon. How many have we put in the Bible? Zip, zero, zilch. Uh, by the way, the Quran, uh, the book of Islam, uh, the Kitab al-Mahsahif of Ibn Abi Dad mentions that al-Hajjaj, yes, I just said some names that were uh, uh, Muslim, uh, al-Hajjaj, who was a close first, uh, in, the, in the beginning of, of Islam, within a hundred years, al-Hajjaj uh, changed the book of uh, Quran. In fact, he made uh, 11 very radical changes uh, that can be traced and seen, this Al-Hajjaj, uh, in, in the translation that's called the uh, Uthman's Mushaf. The Uthman's Mushaf is the oldest manuscript of the book of Quran that is on the planet. It's the one that they really respect the most. And that one came from Al-Hajjaj, 
which basically uh, made massive, 11 massive changes in Mormon uh, doctrine, if you would. Um, these are things that happens with the other books, not with this book. The Bible is never changing. I love that. Um, God can't stop being God. He never changes. He never gives up and says, I'm done being God. I'm, I'm sick of this. You, you guys are on your own. Uh, I thought he became Jim Carrey. Uh, uh, no, no, that was a movie uh, that you should not have watched. <laughs> um, but all that said, uh, uh, God cannot change. That's another thing he cannot do. Praise the Lord for that. Aren't you glad that there's a constant? Aren't you glad that, that God, we're not going to be surprised tomorrow and think, you know, God's just sick of us and so he's going to squish us. No, he never changes and he's a God of love and compassion. Praise the Lord. Quickly, one more. I'll just give you one more. There's more. We can talk about God can never be wrong. We can talk about God can't remember your sins. That's, that's a good one. But I'm going to give you this one because this is important. God cannot save those who do not believe. Isn't that something? God cannot save those who do not believe. I don't know the nuances of this. Uh, and I know for you Calvinists and Arminius that are battling back and forth, uh, that, that I'm going to you know, make some of you upset on this one. Uh, big deal. It's what the Bible's teaching us. What does the Bible say? Let, let me just read you a couple of scriptures. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, slackness but is long-suffering, just patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, to repentance. What do you think that's saying? God wants everybody to repent and to be saved. That's God's heart. That's God's mind. Now, so because of that, people have written books saying, love wins. And they say that everybody's eventually going to make it to heaven because that's what God wants. The problem with that is there's other scriptures that tell us that there's going to be many who are not going to be saved. And in fact, Jesus himself talked about how the narrow is the gate that leads to everlasting life, while broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many will be who go through the broad way to hell. The Bible tells us there's going to be a great white throne judgment. Uh, Book of Revelation chapter 20 tells us that there would be those who will refuse to believe in God and they will stand before God's judgment throne there and they will be sent because of their rejecting God. And I believe God with a compassionate and tearful heart saying, man, I did everything I could, everything within my power to save you. I sent my son who died for your sins, a free gift of salvation, and you rejected that. I sent Christians telling you of the grace of God, and you rejected the gospel. I, I, I used your mother to teach you about the gospel, but you rejected her, her teaching and her, and her encouragement for you to love Jesus and to follow the Lord, and rejected, rejected, and eventually the Lord will say, depart from me, thou wicked servant. And the Bible says they'll be thrown into the lake of fire, Gehenna, is the Greek word, where there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's a heavy topic. Brett, are you saying if I'm the person who doesn't believe in God that I'm going to go to hell? Pretty much. That's what the Bible says. But you say, but if God is love, and if God can do anything, I believe he can save me. Well, you're making a couple huge mistakes. First of all, God can't do anything and everything. God cannot save people who've rejected him and said, I don't want any part of his salvation. That's what the Bible teaches. And so the Bible puts it on us. The Lord says, I've done everything that needs to be done for you to be saved. Here's what you need to do. Uh, believe. You know, for God so loved the world, that's the whole thing where he doesn't want anybody to perish and he loves you so much he doesn't want to send anybody to hell because he doesn't send people to hell. You send yourself to hell if you choose to reject God. So, so for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Man. And Romans uh, chapter uh, 10, verse nine and 10 says, you know, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ that God raised him up from the dead, if you believe that and confess that, it says you will be saved. So people play the dangerous game. Well, if God is love, why would he send people to hell? God is love. He never sent one person to hell. People send themselves there. God has done everything, listen, within his power. And he is almighty and he's all powerful, but there's one limitation to that power. He cannot save. Well, Brett, I believe the foreknowledge of God and he knew everything. You even said that earlier. 
and you've been chosen and predestined, and so we don't know, and God knows, and, and people get all, but that, that's a, a, a sad argument because still the Bible, from this perspective here on earth, puts it on us to believe. So what are you going to do about that? All of these things that we've talked about are things God can't do. And all of them, for me, so far, I've said, oh, man, praise the Lord that he cannot lie. Praise the Lord that he can't be tempted, nor can he tempt me with sin. Praise the Lord that God cannot learn and be disappointed in me because he already knew everything. Praise the Lord that God cannot change. And I can say, praise the Lord that God cannot save the person who doesn't believe because I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, rose from the grave, forgiving me for all my sins. I'm no better than anybody else in this room or on this planet. I'm just a sinner who's been saved because of faith, the grace of God through faith. And you can have that too. All of these can be really good news to you today should you just believe and accept. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to let you use the last few minutes of this service, service that we have to, um, to, to do some time just you and the Lord. Let's just take this time very seriously and, and rejoice and give glory and thanks to the Lord for who he is. If you're a Christian here, why don't you join me and just be in, in kind of an attitude and a spirit of prayer. Would you bow your heads please with me? Everybody just bow your heads. Attitude of prayer. And I'm gonna ask that, um, that if you're not a Christian, if you've never confessed Christ. Now remember, a Christian is not a person who goes to church. That's something Christians do, but that's not what makes you a Christian. A, a Christian is a person who believes and has confessed Jesus Christ. That he died on the cross, that he rose from the grave, and they believe that. And if you've never done that, you could have gone to church all your life, but if the pastor never gave you the gospel message of salvation, and if, if you've never been asked... Do you want to accept and believe and, and verbalize that? Because it's confession with the mouth that is unto salvation, the scriptures say. And so you have that option. If you've never done it, man, I can lead you in a prayer of confession, but it's got to come from your heart. If that's you and you want that, before we go to the table of communion, by the way, if you don't believe, then this table means nothing and, and you, you shouldn't go to the table. But if you are one who believes, Jesus told us about communion and it's really a picture of exactly what I'm talking about, salvation, forgiveness of sin, power over sin, the loving kindness of God, his son, Jesus. That's why we go to the table of the Lord. So before we do that, you could come to this table today, even if it's your first time going to communion, you can do that if you believe and confess. If that's you, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I won't make you come down to the front and do embarrassing things or sign you up or anything like that. But right where you sit, you can confess Christ, just between the Lord and you and me. So with Christians, with your heads bowed, I'm gonna ask if that's you and you're saying, Brett, I wanna become a Christian today. Would you simply acknowledge that? Just let me know by, by looking up. If you're looking up, if you look at me and I see you looking, I'm gonna know that you're saying, yep, I wanna become a Christian. Cool, that's great. Good, good. Good, I see you there. Awesome. Let me just look around for a minute. Make sure I see it. You back there, good. That's great. Those of you that are looking up right now, just understand that some people have a struggle with this because in this world, you can't get anything for free. You gotta do something, you gotta work hard. That's true, generally, but not with this one. This really is the free gift of salvation. Jesus did it all. All we need to do is really take it and receive it and believe. You know, and it's also, I guess, including, you know, you gotta repent and say, I am a sinner. It doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect from this day forward. It means you're perfectly forgiven. We all still struggle, wrestle with sin, but we're acknowledging that we're sinners and we need to save you. That's what really it's all about. And so I'm gonna do that little confession right now before the Lord. I'm gonna pray that out. I'm gonna ask the whole church to pray with me out loud. Uh, Christians, get behind these eight or nine people and just say yes. So let's pray this prayer together. And those of you who looked up, just pray this right to the Lord. Dear Father in heaven, I believe in your son, Jesus, that he came and died for my sins. 
and I believe he rose up from the grave and that I'm forgiven. And now help me to walk with you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. And Lord, for these people who have just confessed you, I would pray, Lord, that you would just wrap your arms around them, that they would somehow sense, Lord, your warmth and your goodness and your kindness in their lives, and that they would also sense, Lord, um, that deep love that you have for them. I pray, Father, that uh, there'd be no condemnation. Lord, we know that we've all failed. We know that we've all messed up, but I pray that the enemy would have no way of um, discouraging or distracting from what you've just done. May they get plugged into a good church that loves you and follows after you. May they know you with all their hearts, Lord. And, and for the rest of us, we're so thankful, Lord, for the, the salvation you've given to us. We're thankful for this act of communion that we get to do as a remembrance. We remember how your son told the disciples, do this in remembrance of me. That we were to eat the, the bread as a, as a symbol of his body that was bruised. Lord, we're thankful for that remembrance for we know the nails that were in your hands should have been through ours. We know, Lord, that the crown of thorns should have been on our head and the whipping on the back should have been on our back, but you took that for us. You endured it for the joy that was set before you, despising the shame, your word says, that you laid your life down for us. We're thankful. So, Lord, for all the things that you cannot do that your word tells us, we're glad, Lord. We're glad that you cannot lie. We're glad that you cannot be tempted by sin and that you cannot tempt us, that you're never changing. But above all, Lord, we're thankful for the salvation that you've given and made so available to us that we just want to celebrate.